Check, check. Oh, good. It w still works after 18 months. Amazing. <laughs> Hold on. I have to find my light. I forgot about that, too. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. So happy that you're all here in person for our first live event in 18 months. And we are also extremely pleased that there are people at home watching on Zoom. So we are in the process here at the Strom Jewish Community Center Arts and Ideas stage of getting everyone together virtually and in person. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome. By the way, I did want to say that there's plenty of room in the theater. If you feel in any way uncomfortable or if you would like to move back, there's plenty of room. So please spread out if you would like to. Um, anyhow, I just want to welcome everyone. I'm Pamela Lavitt, the Director of Arts and Ideas and Festivals, and hopefully we get back to being festive in the festivals world. Uh, we are very happy to here to have Mark Oppenheimer joining us today, who is a good friend of the Strom Jewish Community Center and has been here on our stage before with the Unorthodox podcast. I just want to tell you a little bit about what is going on with Arts and Ideas, because we are still trying to keep the pulse and the heartbeat alive of arts in our community. And amazingly, we actually have folks on Zoom today who are joining us also as far as uh, British Columbia. So this is the one benefit, of course, and I'm gonna sit down, make sure I have my light, but uh, the one benefit of being virtual is that we have been able to do programs with audiences all over the country, including an interview with Mark and the Unorthodox podcast for their last book, The Newish Jewish Encyclopedia. And so I just wanted to invite everyone to continue to join us, tell your friends across the country to Zoom in. We have a number of amazing programs coming up, and the next couple are virtual, so I just wanted to invite you to join us on November 14th. We will be bringing the PBS star and chef, James Beard award-winning Emmy-nominated chef, uh, whose name is Patty Yinich. Patty is both a friend of mine, but also has a great new cookbook coming out, Patty's Mexican Table. If anyone has seen it on PBS, she will be joined, and this is the amazing thing of virtual, she'll be joining us via Zoom with Adina Sussman, who is the author of the Sababa Cookbook. Oh, hey, you guys. So Adina Sussman will be joining us, and she was also here on our stage, but she'll be coming in from Tel Aviv to do the interview virtually. So join us on November 14th. Patty Yinich and Adina Sussman will be talking about Mexican Jewish mashup cooking. And Patty will be talking about her heritage growing up Jewish and Mexican. But of course, her new cookbook is called uh, Treasures of the Mexican Table. So without that, I also want to say we have a couple of other virtual events coming up. We are showing a virtual cinema series, which is going to take place until the Seattle Jewish Film Festival begins in March. And that will be both in person and virtually. Uh, we have a film which is a Ophir winner from Israel called Here We Are for National Disability Awareness Month. It is a film about uh, a father and his autistic son, and they do a buddy drive around the country. It's a beautiful film, and you can catch it on our virtual cinema series um, on our website uh, from uh, October uh, 23rd through 30th. I'm also really happy to say we partnered again with the Black Jewish Coalition, uh, which is a rabbi and reverend group. And they are putting together a conversation around multi-faith dialogue about uh, prison justice reform. And Since I've Been Down is a free screening from October 16th through 19th. It is also on our website, and it will be followed with a discussion with rabbis and reverends on October 24th. So everyone who watches the film will be invited into that Zoom around uh, justice. And it's basically from Zoom to action. So there's some action attached to the screening of that. And I want to thank Rabbi Rosenbaum for his incredible work um, with the Black Jewish Coalition. Uh, finally, uh, I just wanted to say all, all of these programs can be found on sjcc.org slash arts, so put that down. And a lot of the events, including today, if Mark gives me permission, uh, at some point are uh, recorded for our YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel, The Richness of Zoom, means if you go to Arts and Ideas on YouTube, you can see most of our author conversations recorded there or our on-demand page. So I hope you'll join us and listen to these events over and over. And everyone in the room will get a link to that in advance of it being released publicly. So you'll be able to watch it. So if you have friends that were supposed to join you today and miss this program, they can do it. We'll also have copies um, of the book afterwards. I wanted to make mention, Mark will be here afterwards. So please join us in the cafe. There'll be signings of the book and you can purchase additional copies of the book. 
Uh, and you all got a post-it for those of you that have a book. If you want something written on there or your name is hard to spell or whatever, please write for Mark on the post-it what you'd like um, him to write on your book. Uh, finally, we're going to have, uh, Mark's going to be up here by himself for about 30 minutes. Since we're on Zoom, I just wanted to tell everyone watching at home, you can put your questions in the chat, and we will answer those questions at the end. You'll be able to answer your questions live, I hope. Uh, those of you here, will, I'll be out later to moderate a conversation and help you. You don't need a microphone. You just have to speak really loudly, and we'll get that, uh, your, your question repeated. So we have about an hour of delicious conversation. But also just wanted to say on the third anniversary, I want to say uh, thank you. We are on the lands of the Duwamish people. I want to thank the Duwamish people for uh, allowing us to be here today. I also want to say that the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, we here were a victim many years ago of gun violence um, and have had a very strong history of, of gun uh, control laws. I want to just take a moment of silence for the victims of, uh, of all gun violence in our community as well as uh, in Pittsburgh, and, uh, and also because we want to realize that um, there's many people that are suffering right now, and we have, um, just want to take a moment of silence if we can all just close our eyes for a moment before we begin. Okay. I am so happy to uh, introduce our guest, Mark Oppenheimer. Uh, Mark is uh, the director of the Yale Journalism Initiative and a lecturer at Yale's English Department, Political Science Department, and Divinity Schools. He received his BA and PhD in Religious Studies from Yale. He was the religion columnist for the New York Times and, in fact, came out to Seattle at one point un under that from 2010 to 2016 and has written for the New York Times, GQ, The Washington Post, Slate, Mother's Jones, the Nation and the Believer, among others. He's been a commentator on NPR and is also the host of Tablet Magazine's podcast, Unorthodox. He is the author of four books, perhaps one for each child, but another one must be coming, because <laughs> he's also an amazing father, uh, and including the newest Jewish encyclopedia. He lives in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm just curious by a show of hands how many were here for the Unorthodox podcast recording that we did here with Dan Savage. Fabulous. Well, welcome. How many are here for the first time? Welcome. So glad to have you here. So without further ado, I just want to let you know, uh, please turn off your cell phones and all of that so that there's no interruptions. Please welcome our author today, Mark Oppenheimer. There we are. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out. It's really great to be here, and, and I know there uh, are also a lot of you on Zoom, and so I, I say hello to you in, um, in Zoom land. Um, I'm going to start with a joke because, you know, it's such an uplifting topic. Um, you know, this really happened, and I, I realized when it really happened that I had to tell my audiences about it, which was the book came out last Tuesday, so less, less than a week ago, and um, I was in a local bookstore, an independent, because I love supporting independents, um, not an independent anywhere on your coast. It's not an independent you know, uh, but a different independent bookstore. And I went in, and being the narcissist that all writers are, as well as the bundle of anxiety that we all are, I wanted to know if they were carrying my book. And so I went up to the desk, and I said, you know, just curious, um, do you by any chance have uh, a book by Mark Oppenheimer? And, and it's called, the, and the, the book seller said, what's it called? And I said, Squirrel Hill. And she said, well, have you checked animals? <laughs> and I said, it's not, it's not about squirrels. And, <laughs> you know, but how, how would she have known, right? But in that moment, actually, I thought, you know, there is something, um, there's something spiritually right about that. Because actually, as those of you who know Squirrel Hill know, and a lot of people, when I go on these talks, I mean, I've, I've already done a few, do know Squirrel Hill. The Pittsburgh diaspora is huge, and Squirrel Hill is such a special place in, uh, in American uh, Judaism, but also in, in the hearts of everyone who loves neighborhood, because it's such a classically wonderful neighborhood, that Squirrel Hill actually is a kind of merry place. It is what it sounds like, which is a, a, if you picture a, a hill where squirrels want to run around, it is a chipper, happy, perky place. And that gets to the heart of something that I hope I'll convey to you today, which is that this is not a sad book. And when I was working on this book, and in a moment I'll, I'll tell you the story of how I came to be working on it, and then we're going to look at some photographs from the book, and 
talk and questions. It's going to be great fun. But when I was working on the book for 18 months after the shooting, you know, I flew to Pittsburgh 32 times, and I interviewed over 200 people, something like 250 people. I was, I was deeply immersed in it. And people would say to me, well, that, that must be such a sad project. And I said, no, I, the stories are often sad. And, of course, something very sad has happened. But it's an immensely hopeful project. I found myself um, almost bouncing with hopefulness sometimes because of the resilience of the people in Squirrel Hill and the way they came together for each other. It is my strong hunch that a lot of you remember where you were when you heard about the shooting at Tree of Life, a shooting that claimed the lives of 11 people of the 22 who were inside. Two more who were inside were badly wounded but survived. Uh, nine emerged physically unscathed. Several of the police officers who responded were also injured. But of the 22 inside, 11 died. It was the worst anti-Semitic killing in the history of uh, this country's land both before and after 2015. But North America has never seen so many Jews killed at once as on that morning. And I'll tell you where I was, which is I was sitting in a car in Boston, Massachusetts, Newton to be precise, the suburb of Newton, where I had gone with my eldest daughter, Rebecca, for the bat mitzvah of a good friend of hers from summer camp. So we were about two hours from home. We live in New Haven, Connecticut. We'd driven up that morning to attend this bat mitzvah. And we left our phones in the car because we try to be as respectful of, of, of the Sabbath as possible. We were inside the synagogue from about 9 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. We had lunch inside the synagogue. We came back out, got in the car, opened up the phones. I wanted to check in with my wife, see that everything was okay on the home front. And I had just screen after screen of messages, you know, are you going to Pittsburgh? Do you know anyone in Pittsburgh? Did you hear about Pittsburgh? When are we going to Pittsburgh? I have no idea what they're talking about. So I navigated over to one of the news apps on my phone and I saw what had happened. And Rebecca saw a look on my face and said, Dad, is, is what's going on? Is everything okay? And I said, there's been a, a shooting at a synagogue in Squirrel Hill. And she said, Squirrel Hill, aren't we from Squirrel Hill? And I said, yeah, we are. Now, not literally. She grew up in New Haven, and I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. But my father, her grandpa, and four generations of his family before him were all from Pittsburgh. And they'd been Squirrel Hill residents uh, for the last three of those five generations, since about the time of World War I, which is when Squirrel Hill was settled. And for about a century exactly, from about 1915, 1920 until the present, about 100 years exactly, it, it, the neighborhood has been substantively Jewish, the oldest, most stable, uh, most consistently Jewish neighborhood in the history of the country. So when I saw that there was a shooting there, I was struck by the irony, as one journalist was seen to write, that the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history came to one of the least anti-Semitic places. Pittsburgh had been such a good home for Jews. And, and including generations of my own family since the 1840s. Pretty soon thereafter, I realized that I wanted to write about this. Um, not only as a, someone who's been practicing journalism for two decades since getting out of, out of college, but also as somebody with family roots in Squirrel Hill, and also as someone who had a very specific curiosity about, about this from, from the start. And this goes back to the, the idea of Squirrel Hill as a merry and, and happy place. It's a place that sounds like squirrels on a hill. It's a place where a book might get shelved in the, the animal section, not in the mass killing section or whatever that's called. I thought almost from the start it would be interesting to write a book about a mass killing that was not about the killer. Let me say that again. It would be interesting to write a book about a mass killing that was not about the killer. There have been some very fine books about mass killings in America. Let me mention Dave Cullen's book, Columbine, which is the greatest of these books. He's also done a book on Parkland. There was a very fine book on the Mother Emanuel shooting in Charleston. In several, in some of these cases, I don't want to say all of them. Oh, there was also an extraordinary book on the killing in, um, in Scandinavia, in Finland. I think 70 people were killed. Is that Finland or Norway? Norway, thank you. I always get that wrong. There's an extraordinary book that's been translated uh, into English about that killer. But so often the inclination is to focus on the killer. I had no interest in this killer. I had no interest in spending my time in the swamp of white supremacist, anti-Semitic, 
lunacy on the internet that it turned out had likely motivated the alleged shooter who still awaits trial. But what I was very interested in was the neighborhood, the place where squirrels run on a hill, right? It was the neighborhood where my family had lived. I was very interested in what came after the killer had been apprehended and after the shooting. I was interested in how people respond and what goes on in a neighborhood when the death has come and gone, like an electrical storm, just like a tornado blowing through town and leaving this debris. How do people pick up and clean up? Because I thought that would be a really interesting story and maybe one that doesn't get told often enough. So that's what I did. I spent 18 months hanging out, getting to know the people who took a role in the healing and the grieving and the post-traumatic activity, the life of the town, bringing it back to life and figuring out how to survive and also how to thrive in the aftermath of this killing, which is why the book is called Squirrel Hill, because the protagonist here is the neighborhood and so many people in it. Let me read you just two quick pages from this, and then I want to look at some of the photographs from the book. The book has 60 photographs. It's chock full of them. Uh, I think I write good prose, but I actually thought that there's really nothing so vivid as seeing the people involved to, to, to bring them to life. So I want to I wanna read a little bit, and then I want to take you through some photos, and then we'll talk a little bit. And then it's actually at the very end, I want to I wanna read a, a fun passage to leave you on. So I'm going to read two pages that are about a woman named Tammy Peps, who does not attend Tree of Life Synagogue. She attends a different synagogue, but she's a, a neighborhood, um, a neighborhood mocker, a big shot in the neighborhood. Everyone knows her. Uh, she's very active in community affairs. She's a, a genealogist who does a lot on uh, Jewish history there. And she woke up that morning to the sound of sirens. Um, she then had this extraordinary 24 hours where she encountered family members uh, who she knew who had lost a relative there. She comforted them. She helped write a letter demanding that Donald Trump not come to town because it was already clear that Trump was promising a visit. Two days hence, he announced almost immediately that he would come to Pittsburgh. She's active in Family Arc, the progressive Jewish organization that uh, wanted to take a stand against Trump if he came to town. So she'd had this extraordinary 24 hours. She barely slept. And then the next day, she's walking uh, back to the house. And, the, and I just want, and she had an extraordinary encounter that I want to read to you very quickly. When Hepps made a turn onto Murray Avenue, a truck pulled up in front of her. On the side of it were painted three curious words, crosses for losses. As Hepps remembered it, she looked into the truck and she saw a pile of crosses in the back. They were all white, and on quick count, she decided there were 11 of them. As soon as she grasped what she was seeing, she was incensed. I thought to myself, you have got to be fucking kidding me, Hepps remembered. And I looked around and no one else was there, and I thought, if I have to be the one to tell him he can't put crosses on a synagogue, I will be the one to tell him he cannot put crosses on a synagogue. Hepps had no idea who this guy was with this kind of nerve. As she was figuring out what to say to him, trying to keep her cool, she saw on the front seat of his truck a pile of wooden six-pointed stars. She was relieved. I thought, okay, what will happen here is he's going to put the stars of David on the crosses, and it will be okay. The man she's encountered, ed ed editorial aside here, the man she's encountered is Gregory Zanus, who died last December. His obituary was in the New York Times. He was famous for founding this nonprofit called Crosses for Losses. He drove across the country in his own truck, um, planting crosses in honor of, the, of victims of violent deaths, um, sometimes plane crashes, but more often people who had died in mass killings. Uh, so he became sort of this figure. He was an evangelical Christian, but as we're learning, he tried to be sensitive when he was planting crosses in honor of non-Christians. Zanus got out on the driver's side of the truck and approached Hepps. She looked him up and down. He was tired, unshaven, old. What was he doing here? Where had he come from? Then she looked down and saw his hands, and it was as if something became clear. I saw his hands were covered in white paint, Hepps remembered. It's like he painted these things overnight and didn't even have time to wash his hands. He told me his intention. He said to me, I made these things, got in my truck, and drove nine hours. There was white paint on his hands. He said to me, I've been driving the whole time. I don't even know the names of the people who have died. I have to write their names on the stars. 
And then Hepz knew what she had to do. Her mother had emailed her the full list of the dead that morning. So she had the names on her phone. Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Malinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, her younger. I brought up this list, and he handed me a pen and his notebook, and I was shaking as I copied these names into his notebook. I had terrible handwriting. So he could write the names on the stars. When Hepps had written down all 11 names, she gave Zanus's notebook back to him. Now he had a question for him. I said to him, why do you do this? He said that there had been gun violence in his family, and this was his response. He said, do you remember Parkland? I did that one. Remember Columbine? I did that one too. It had never occurred to me, Hepps said. There was one person who had made it his life's work to drive around the country and do this. And at that moment, I realized we are just another one on the list. So who comes after the killing has happened? What does the aftermath look like? Well, number one, it looks like Greg Zanus, the crosses for losses rolling into town. Maybe we could take a look at some photographs now. <clears throat> and there he is. This is not at Tree of Life. This is a photograph from another event he did. But as you can see, those are his crosses. He builds them in the back of his truck, or he did. Um, he said, I travel with my truck and a Home Depot credit card. By the way, I, I always forget if he said Lowe's credit card or Home Depot credit card. So fact check me. I could be wrong there. But he travels in his truck. He had went through four trucks with millions of miles on them. It's what he did after retiring from carpentry with the last 20 years of his life. He traveled in his truck, and he built as he went. Another thing that happens in the aftermath of a mass shooting is people rush to, to, to commemorate it visually, which in a sense is what Greg Zanus was doing. And this, I think, is the first thing that happens, is people, people want to somehow make a visual mark. So within 24 hours, this image that I'm showing you right now is everywhere. So the football fans here will recognize it as the Pittsburgh Steelers logo with the yellow hypocycloid, a geometric term I learned in researching this book, replaced with a yellow Star of David at the top. It was the creation not of a Jew, but of a German-American lapsed Lutheran graphic designer named Tim Hindis, who lived in the Pittsburgh suburbs. And within a couple hours of the shooting, early afternoon on October 27th, 2018, was fiddling around at his Mac, trying to figure out what he could do to help the victims, how he could contribute. And he came up with this design, the Steelers logo, but with the yellow replaced with the Star of David and the legend Stronger Than Hate on it. He posted it to Facebook, um, yada yada, as they say. And by the time of the football game the next day, people were holding it aloft in the stands at the Steelers game. It was all over Facebook. It was in the shop windows throughout Squirrel Hill, and it's become one of the iconic images of the shooting and its aftermath. The editor-in-chief of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, David Shribman, uh, a Reformed Jew married to a Roman Catholic, but whose daughter, Natalie Shribman, was recently ordained as a Reformed rabbi, so there's a lot of Judaism in the house. He was trying to figure out what he could do with his newspaper, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, that would honor the victims. And so on the Friday after the shooting, he ran this headline, which some of you will be able to read as Yitzhadal v'yitzhadah Shemei Rabbah. It's the first line of the mourner's cottage, the prayer for the dead in Judaism. Some of you with especially keen eyes will notice that the last letter on the left uh, is incorrect. It should be an aleph, not a hey, but um, they did their best with the orthography. And um, it was an extraordinary act, running Hebrew script at the top of an American newspaper. No one's sure that this had happened before, that an English language newspaper in the United States had run a Hebrew headline. And as people went and picked up their newspapers that Friday morning, they, throughout the city, they just broke down in tears. It was, it was so moving to them. And then what's more American than Starbucks? And so what's a better response to a tragedy than to somehow commemorate it in the windows of a Starbucks? This uh, design of um, <clears throat> three Jewish symbols, the Star of David, the Tree of Life, and the Dove. This week, of course, we read Parshat Noach, the, the story of the Ark 
Noah's Ark and the Dove was read yesterday in synagogues throughout the world, so fitting to be talking about it today. Um, was, whoop, back up one second, uh, was painted in the, um, in the windows of the Starbuck on, Starbucks on Forbes Avenue in the center of Squirrel Hill. When the Presbyterian manager of the Starbucks called her lapsed Catholic friend and said, we need to do something for our Jewish customers. And so the Catholic artist um, hooked up with a Jew and asked her to teach him, asked him to teach her some meaningful Hebrew letters and he perfectly reproduced them. In the window, you'll see Ahava for love, Chesed for kindness, and Tikva for hope. And they, they, they are still in that Starbucks window to this day. I think they're part of the permanent landscape of Squirrel Hill. Okay. And then, um, this is not a good photograph because I took it, but it's a meaningful photograph. This is the Squirrel Hill sign when you get off the exit at Forward Avenue and you sort of ascend the climb into Squirrel Hill, you will see that right next to the squirrel hanging from the H is a little handcrafted tinsel Star of David. It's one of the last, this is, this is in the spring, it's probably March after the shooting, so about four or five months have elapsed and a rather cruel winter. There used to be many Stars of David hanging throughout Squirrel Hill. There was a worldwide effort to handicraft Stars of David and to knit them, crochet them, uh, make them out of ceramics, cut them out of paper, and some Facebook groups organized to collect them all and then, then just put them throughout the city and especially Squirrel Hill. And that winter, you could stand in the middle of a snowstorm and look up and see snowflakes falling amidst Stars of David hung from trees and street lamps. The winter, of course, eventually did away with most of them, but when I was driving in in the spring, I saw that this one uh, still survived hanging from the H on the Squirrel Hill sign. The funerals took four days, Tuesday through Friday. Um, again, 11 Jews had to be buried. This is a group of Orthodox Jews walking behind one of the hearses. And what's notable here is that none of those who died was an Orthodox Jew. They attended Reconstructionist and conservative synagogues. There were three synagogues inside the building that, were, that was attacked. Each of the three congregations, the landlord congregation and the two tenant congregations lost members, none of them Orthodox. And yet in the aftermath, all the Jews of Squirrel Hill, and indeed many Gentile allies, Christian, Muslim, and otherwise, came together and mourned as if members of their own community had been killed. So the fact that so much of the iconography is of Orthodox and observant Jews and of non-Jews is something very, very special about Pittsburgh and, and worth meditating on. Um, I forget this man's name. He's in my book. Uh, not Jewish, no particular attachment to the people who died, just standing by the synagogue door, or excuse me, standing by the cemetery gates, watching the, the cars roll in. One of the other things that happens in the aftermath of a mass shooting is that money flows in. A lot of people, you know, some people want to bake goods for the, 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 the victims' families. Some people want to create symbols. Some people just want to write a check or go to the website and give their credit card number, right? Um, this is the most, um, successful fundraiser, the most lucrative fundraiser. He is a uh, Iranian lapsed Muslim wannabe American named Shai Khatiri. He's a, uh, he fled Iran, hopes to become an American citizen. He's a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, lives in Washington, D.C. Uh, woke up hungover the day of the shooting at about midday after having imbibed the alcohol that the Ayatollahs would never have permitted back home and on um, the sofa in Washington, D.C. where he was crashing, he roused himself, and his, his friend who had let him crash there, a good friend of his who was Jewish, was very upset. He said, what's going on? He said, there's been a murder of Jews in Pittsburgh. Got up, showered, went to his coffee shop, and opened a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for the Jews in Squirrel Hill. It ended up, within a week, raising over a million dollars out of about seven million that was eventually raised from around the world. So about one-seventh of it was thanks to Shai Khatiri, um, again, a lapsed Muslim, ex-Iranian, wannabe American. A bunch of teenagers gathered that Saturday at the Starbucks that I showed you to plan a Havdalah service. That's the Saturday night ritual marking the end of Sabbath. Um, the, uh, the organized Jewish community, the Jewish Federation, and all the synagogue rabbis had agreed they would do something the following day. There was a big memorial event to be held on Sunday, but a bunch of teenagers from the local uh, public high school, Taylor Alderdice High School, wanted to do something right away, Saturday night. And so um, they uh, quickly organized an event 
uh, for Havdalah, they, they gathered hundreds of candles, they gathered, um, they found a stage with a microphone, they found someone to play guitar as a song leader, and within several hours, they pulled together a massive event in honor of the victims, entirely run by local teenagers, Jewish and not. The woman on the left there, Emily Pressman, now a college student is Jewish. Her friend Isabel Smith on the right, uh, not Jewish. And uh, they and about a dozen other teenagers made this happen. You can see the intersection of Forbes and Murray. There were thousands of people there that night. You can see their umbrellas up that had been raining off and on all day. A lot of them have lit candles. A lot of them have lit the modern candle, which is to say the, uh, the flashlight on their iPhone. The president did come. He came on Tuesday. And uh, you will recognize the president and the first lady standing in front of Greg Zanus's Stars of David, his crosses for losses with stars uh, affixed to the front. You can see the names of some of the dead, Sylvan Simon, Bernice Simon. They were a married couple. They were killed in the, uh, in the building in which they'd been married about 60 years earlier. Um, to the right is Rabbi Jeffrey Myers, who's the rabbi of the Tree of Life Synagogue. It was very controversial. A lot of people didn't want him to meet with the president. They felt that Trump and Trump's rhetoric were partly to blame for what they took to be a white supremacist killing. Uh, Meyer's position, as I understand it, was that rabbis offer hospitality to anybody, and that he was not at liberty not to meet with the president. And they met for about 20 minutes inside the building, and then they talked briefly outside the building, and then the president went on his way to visit some of the wounded in a nearby hospital. But there was protest, and it was a peaceful protest. You can see, if you look carefully, that what the protesters are doing is holding aloft black strips of paper. They performed a kind of um, korea. This is the Jewish ritual of mourning. If someone's dead, you know that it's traditional to, to tear your garment uh, as a, a kind of strike against vanity. Um, sometimes people will affix a black ribbon to their garment and then rip that ribbon. And what they did was they handed out black pieces of paper. And they, on cue, they all simultaneously tore the black pieces of paper as an act of mourning and also as a, a, a gesture against the president's visit. Some people were less um, polite about <laughs> their objection to the president's visit. Uh, but there was at least one sign that said, uh, as you can see, Nazi Trump uh, F off. <laughs> this picture did not end up in the book. Um, and, you know, I, I, it did not really represent what the march was and what the, the, it was largely peaceful. And um, even, we, we could look at the next photograph, even when somebody was arre arrested, and that's Pittsburgh sociology, University of Pittsburgh sociologist Joshua Bloom uh, being arrested after lying down in front of Trump's motorcade, it was an overwhelmingly peaceful march, uh, no question. So the, the sign, some of the signage was more aggressive than some of the other signage, but it was, um, but it was a peaceful protest. One person pointed out to me that of the thousands of people who came out to protest Trump, um, certainly a great number of them were Jews, and although this would be unprovable, one person averred to me that it might have been the largest gathering of Jews in Squirrel Hill history, the anti-Trump protest. This, of course, had pulled Jews from every different congregation. It pulled secular Jews who would never go to synagogue. That There may have been more Jews in Squirrel Hill at the anti-Trump protest than ever had come together for any one reason in Squirrel Hill history, that Trump might have done what, what rabbis fail to do, which is to pull out all the Jews. Uh, who knows, but it's, a, it's an interesting thought experiment. Another thing that happens in the aftermath of a mass killing is celebrities come. Uh, Tom Hanks is some sort of honorary chairperson of the effort to raise money to renovate and, and, and uh, reconstitute Tree of Life, which, need, which is still closed. The building is riddled with bullet holes, and there are blood stains on the floor, and if they re renovate it, it has to be brought up to code. So that's a huge project, but Tom Hanks has played a role, and here he is uh, some weeks after the shooting, embracing, uh, in a sense, America's other first lady, that's Joanne Rogers, the widow of Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, who, of course, was from Squirrel Hill and worshiped at Sixth Presbyterian Church at the corner of Forbes and Murray, thus basically establishing for us that Squirrel Hill, where he lived for decades, was in fact Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, that it was quite inarguably the basis for America's template of a happy neighborhood, <laughs> Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Uh, does anyone know who that, that celebrity is, wh whose back is to us with the, the full head of white hair? Anyone know? I'll give you a hint. Think football. 
That's Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, who was raised in an observant Jewish household and uh, is a synagogue goer and came to town uh, that uh, winter for the first uh, bar mitzvah held by the Tree of Life congregation since the shooting. The, the Steelers were playing the Patriots the next day, so he had to be there for the game the next day, and he showed up with a couple tickets to the game for the bar mitzvah boy. And, um, and he even put on the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers stronger than hate Jewish star Steelers mashup yarmulke. And I had, even though it was the Sabbath, I had to take my phone out to take this picture. I thought God wanted me to take this picture <laughs> because it's surely the only extant picture of Robert Kraft wearing athletic gear of a team other than the New England Patriots, right? Wearing the Steelers stronger than hate yarmulke. So that is Robert Kraft. By the way, being the good journalist that I am, when he went up to go to the bathroom, I followed him in to see if I could get some interesting on-the-record comments. And so he went to the urinal. I went to the urinal next to him. Um, we chatted. <laughs> he said, do you think that went okay? He had gotten up to say a few words to the boy. I said, I think it went well. He zipped up. He washed his hands. That was all I got. In the aftermath of mass killings today, there are dogs everywhere. Therapy dogs, comfort dogs, uh, in one case, uh, dogs that were referred to by their trainers as canine advocates, which is a different thing from a therapy dog. And I just love dogs. I love that there were dogs everywhere. Some of the dogs wore jackets with various forms of certificates and licensure. Other dogs were just dogs. Um, I love this picture. I wanted it to be the cover of my book, but it doesn't really scream Squirrel Hill or mass killings, and it would certainly get the book misclassified in animals. <laughs> but if you look at the sign at the card that this young person is holding, it says, as she's petting the dog, it says, she's holding a, sign, a card that says, thank you for keeping the Jews in my neighborhood safe. Thank you for, hold on. Thank you for risking your lives to save my Jewish community. Love, Mikey, age nine. And I imagine it was one of the many cards that was made for the, uh, the police officers in the aftermath of the shooting. Response to trauma is interesting. So some people wanna hug dogs. Some people say they don't need anything at all. This is Joe Charney. He was the, elder, the oldest survivor of the shooting. Uh, he was in his early 90s, still alive. Um, and when I talked to him, I said, did you use any of the therapy groups, the grief counseling, the dogs? And he said, no, I didn't need any of that stuff. I was fine. My kids came to visit from out of town to check up on me. I sent them home. I mean, this is a guy who'd been in the room with the shooter. He'd looked at the shooter, and the shooter had fired at someone else, and he'd walked out. He'd survived. He, like, literally saw people getting blown away. And he was fine. And I said, how is that, how is that possible? He said, look, I served in World War II. You wouldn't believe the stuff I saw there. And he said, I had a fairly unsuccessful career with a lot of sadness in it. He'd, he'd, sort of, he'd been a doctor who had never really made it, um, as he put it to me. He said, I, honestly, surviving a mass killing is hardly the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And as I was getting up to leave, I said, your children came to visit. Now, you have two children? He said, well, actually, I have three. My eldest son, he was brilliant, uh, David. Um, he was the, one of the youngest people ever tenured at Harvard Law School. He was a brilliant man. Um, but he was gay, and he got AIDS before they knew what to do about it, and he died. And I realized, holy cow, when you've been a war veteran who's seen people die in the theater of war, and you've lost a son to HIV, surviving a mass killing is hardly the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to you. But people respond differently. Everyone has a different story. And the last picture I want to show you is, uh, speaking of people responding differently, is Robert Zacharias, who was a young fairly secular Jew, he teaches some sort of robotics that I don't understand at Carnegie Mellon University. And um, the day of the shooting, he was going to that vigil organized by the teams, the Havdalah vigil. And before he left, he, um, he put on his, he reached into a, his closet, found the one yarmulke he owned, and he put it on his head, slapped it on his head. He'd never worn a yarmulke before for any sort of non-ritual purpose. And, um, and he went to the Havdalah, and afterwards he left the yarmulke on his head. And the next morning he got up and he thought, well, what the heck, I'll put it on again. And he just kept wearing it. And he's not an Orthodox Jew. He's not someone, I don't think he keeps kosher to this day. I don't think he keeps the Sabbath. He in no way, he made it very clear he doesn't represent observance, but he wanted to be more publicly visibly Jewish after that. 
And I just want to conclude by saying that those stories were legion. You know, the person I met who decided to convert to Judaism after the shooting, the people who raised money, the people who did handiworks that they wanted, the people who baked challahs, um, the, the woman who showed up at the funeral home as they were preparing the bodies, as they were washing the bodies and knocked at the back door, and someone opened the door, one of the people doing tahara, doing this, the washing of the bodies, and this Gentile woman just handed a, a wad of money, something like $1,000, and said, it's for, it's for the families, and just ran off into the night. I mean, if you looked closely enough, the, 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 the trillion acts of chesed of loving kindness in the aftermath really did um, light some sort of way forward. And while in no sense do they obliterate the fact that this was one of the saddest things to happen, and I've reported on clergy abuse, I've reported on all sorts of sad things, and this is certainly as sad as anything that I've reported on, um, in many very real ways, it does end up being a very hopeful story. So thank you. Um, come on up. Come on up. Um, yeah, I want to take some questions. Pam, I want you to, to get some questions for me, either from Zoom or from these wonderful people here. You're Hi, you can hear me now. So just a reminder, those of you who are on Zoom, do submit to the chat, and we'll uh, take those questions just a moment. Um, I just wanted to also thank our partners at ADL, um, Anti-Defamation League, Pacific Northwest Region, as well as uh, Hillel University of Washington for being our community partners today. Um, so, Mark. Yeah. Amazingly, this book reminds me of a lot of critical geography work in the academic world, right? You, the neighborhood, and I know yeah. Rivi's from Squirrel Hill. <laughs> yes, and she's here today. So it's very unique. You, t you, you know, the character of Squirrel Hill as a neighborhood and the idea that place is such an important part. You have maps at the beginning. You show us the, mm -hmm. the geography in the book of where people live. Uh, where the different institutions are. And then you have a section of the book where you talk about how most of us, including Seattle, we have Seward Park, right? So that's where you have, you know, the Orthodox community and you have the Sephardic community and then you have Capitol Hill and there's lots of different neighborhoods. But Squirrel Hill is very unique in its geography. Can you just take a moment to talk about um, if it is the most unique person place in the United States in this regard, and how many people are actually there? Right. So, um, <clears throat> yes, there's something you know. Uh, there's something very special about Squirrel Hill, and I could sum it up this way. The two. Let me give you two things. One is that it is extremely Jewishly integrated, by which I mean the Orthodox. It's the Orthodox neighborhood, but it's also the Reform neighborhood, and it's also the Reconstruction's neighborhood. It's also the conservative neighborhood. It's also the secular neighborhood. All of these Jews live side by side and have since my dad was little. I mean, one of his best friends, my dad was from a very classical reform background. I mean, they're, you know, the, as they called Rodef Sholem, St. Rodef's. I mean, it was very churchy. It was very, um, you know, no yarmulkes anywhere in sight. They would, take, they would yank the yarmulke off your head if you tried to wear it inside. And one of his best friends, you know, was Orthodox and lived right across the street. And that was not uncommon. And in most American Jewish communities, um, Jews tend to be balkanized in different, I'm always, I always laugh when I use the term balkanized because of course there are no Jews left in the Balkans. But um, Jews tend to be separated from each other uh, so that the Orthodox tend not to live near the other Jews and the other Jews and then the secular Jews are dispersed to the winds. Um, so that's number one, is it is relatively more integrated Jewishly uh, than other communities. The other thing is that Squirrel Hill has remained about a third Jewish for a century. It's not 50% or 60% Jewish. To be clear, it's, it's never been a majority Jewish, but it's been a, a meaningful third or so Jewish for about a century. And that comes from certain choices that were made, particularly in the 80s and 90s, by Jewish institutions not to go to the suburbs. They realized they were at some tipping points where if they, um, if they moved the JCC, which needed to be rebuilt and rehabbed, if they moved the Jewish Social Service Agency, if they moved the Home for the Aged to the Burbs, then Squirrel Hill was kind of done for because then to, uh, if Jews were interested in being your other Jews, they'd move to the various suburbs. But they reconstituted everything in the city, and that was a very brave act. It was a very intentional act. I talk about it in the book. And um, it's a real kind of lesson in urbanism and how you make, how you keep neighborhoods intact. Um, so it's, to me, it was, that was actually a piece of it as somebody who's interested in neighborhood and urbanism that was very close to my heart. Well, that was a section of the book that I really enjoyed, especially because, you know, Seattle has a history of our own redlining and things like that. And you do spend a bit of time in the book talking about 
um, the different populations and the integrations of, of, the, of the city of Pittsburgh, which I really enjoyed. Your book is also very much a journalist book, but there's a lot of sociology in there as well about people who stepped up, and you sort of separate them in the structure of the book a little bit. We talked about this a little bit in the car. You have a section about um, trauma tourists, which I think is uh, an interesting uh, name, because there are a number of people that also you focus on, uh, such as the gentleman, Greg, who created the crosses with the Stars of David, and you talk a little bit about the controversial aspects of that, but you, you kind of elevate him as coming into the town and building these, but yet there are other people that came in that weren't so welcome. Can you talk about that? Sure, I mean, one of the things that happens after mass killings is a lot of people show up. And you know, there was a preacher who came up from Florida because he just wanted to stand outside and pray with people. These are not people who by and large were looking for an evangelical preacher to pray with them, but he came. Um, there were a lot of Jews who came who were unwanted. Uh, there were, I have a whole section on the woman in the Orthodox community who became the point person for requests from Orthodox high school teachers who wanted to bring busloads of their students in to just be at the shivas, be at the funerals, kind of bear witness. And she was trying to fend them off. And she was saying, look, we don't have the kosher food for them. We don't have anywhere to lodge them. We're trying to bury our dead. We have funerals starting on Tuesday and going until Friday. We're very grateful, but please stay away. And that, um, and there, I would say that some of the real moments of tension in the book are some of the well-meaning Jews who want to come and be in solidarity as Jews and who have to hear this news from the Pittsburgh Jewish community, that, which is that they're not wanted or needed, and some of them come anyway. And, um, you know, uh, that's, that's, there's some moments of real comic relief around that, but there's also, that was something that was very trying for a lot of the, the Jews of Squirrel Hill. When they were doing the burials, um, they did it according to Jewish tradition. They performed tafaras. There were Hevra Kadishas, holy societies that washed the bodies. There were some holy societies from Brooklyn that showed up and said, well, let us do it. We know how to do it. And these Pittsburgh people said, no, we, we, can, we can bury our own. And they had this kind of standoff with these ultra-Orthodox guys from Brooklyn who showed up with all their knowledge and their hubris. And you know that was that was pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, I love that part of the book where you know the Shomrim people who have to watch over the dead, a medieval custom, of course, of not letting the body and the soul separate before burial. And I love that there were sort of Shabbos goys, for lack of a better term, who sort of stepped up while people were mourning and taking care of the dead to help out. So can you talk about that a little bit? And then you guys get to prepare yeah. for your questions next. I mean, there were a lot of Gentile allies. I always want to call them Gentile allies because that's what they are. You know, who stepped up. Um, you know, one woman in particular, Tracy Baton, told some Gentile, who's an African American Mennonite, told some fellow Gentiles who wanted to have some sort of solidarity march, said, you know, this is not your place. Like, let the Jews figure out how to do this. Check in with them first. Make sure that, you know, you're running everything past Jews before you. It was a, a suburban politician, Gentile politician, who actually I interviewed, and it turned out he was like a quarter Jewish. But. <laughs> He was, and the child of the descendant of Holocaust survivors. But he was known as a Gentile. He wasn't part of the Jewish community, and he was trying to start some sort of event, and she basically told him, stand down. And there were a lot of Gentiles who did that work of creating space for the Jews to grieve and to mourn. Because again, Squirrel Hill's a mostly, gen like America, it's mostly Gentile. And, um, and Jews do depend on the goodwill of their neighbors um, for, for the grieving and, and so much more. So perhaps I just have one more political question. <laughs> Uh, there is a whole section of the book, of course, about the former president coming, but I, I was recently listening to Isabel Wilkerson's book, Past, and she has a moment in the book in which she meets with uh, Taylor Branch, of course, the uh, three books uh, on the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King, in which she asks Taylor Branch after the Tree of Life synagogue shooting, she actually has a conversation with him and says, so are we in 1880 or are we in 1950? And I'm wondering what year you think we're in, because I think it was a moment in Jewish life that might not have been either 1880 or 1950, but do you have any well, reflections on that? I don't, yeah, that's interesting. I don't draw big lessons from singular events. I think, I like to think I'm enough of a student of statistics to know when I see a small sample size. There have been several very deadly attacks on Jews in American history, one here, one in Kansas, uh, one in Pittsburgh. There have been historically significant, but you know, uh, 
low bloodshed events like the lynching, lynching of Leo Frank and George, I mean, we, we can name most of them and that's a testament to how safe Jews have been in America. I'm very wary of using Tree of Life as a reason to lapse into a kind of security state mentality. Um, the odds that any Jew is going to be the victim of a violent crime, um, especially any white presenting Jew, any Ashkenazi Jew who doesn't wear Jewish garb is vanishingly small in America and still is. Um, now that said, we are definitely in a period of, of an uptick in violence against Jewish presenting Jews and against Jews who, to use the term that was coined by someone on Twitter, who, who are doing it. That is to say, like, I see us heading into a time of division between Jews who Jew it, that is to say, come to events at the J, go to synagogue, put Hanukkah candles in their window after they light them, who will do something that is publicly Jewish, whether it's worship oriented or culture oriented or cuisine oriented, but that put them in the gun sites of those who hate Jews, right? Um, and therefore put themselves at risk, minor risk, like, and we're all safer than anyone is right now in Syria or Venezuela, like let's be clear about that, but nevertheless heightened risk. A division between those Jews and Jews who were entirely invisible as Jews to, to the anti-Semites, who may have an inner Jewish pride but are not visibly doing it. 50 or 60 or 75 years ago, those Jews had a lot of other problems. They wouldn't make partner in their law firm, they couldn't get into the country club they wanted to, there were neighborhoods that didn't want them. Those disabilities against those Jews have largely disappeared, to be frank. It's not that you couldn't find it, but they've largely disappeared. So the, the disabilities that are left against Jews are against Jews who present as Jews because they're doing it. And these people are dead because they, because they go to Shabbos services. So I think that like it's, we really have to be careful. That's not a pat and neat answer, but the answer is we're not in 1880 or 1950. We're not in nothing if you don't ever go to stuff at the J or at synagogue. You can, then you're, for most Jews, then you're a white person listening to NPR with your tote bags and your herb garden. And that's a pretty safe thing to be. But these people went, they went to shul. That's, that's why they're dead. Well, in Jewish history, perhaps 1880 and 1950 are yep. the years that we, as you know, the Jewish community, helped each other out the most, right? Um, you know, immigration and after World War II. So perhaps those years mean something different in, in our timeline. Um, I'd like to invite um, those of you that are here to ask questions. And just so you know, I'll repeat it so those of you at home can hear it. So we have a question right here. Go ahead. Awesome. I will. That's a great question. So our friend is studying bibliotherapy and asked if telling the stories is either healing for me or for any of the people I encounter. Let me speak about me first, because um, I'm an expert on me. Um, you know, there is a lot of discussion in the journalism world about journalists and trauma. There's actually a center at Columbia University, the Dart Center for Journalists and Trauma, run by my friend Drew Shapiro, who himself was a victim of a violent crime, who was once um, attacked with a knife by uh, a madman, a schizophrenic madman at a coffee shop who just ran in and started stabbing people. Um, and I know of one other writer who has quite prominently written about mass killings who um, himself suffered some very severe depression that he traces to having been that immersed in the trauma. I think he's told the story publicly, but I'm not gonna name him here because I can't remember how public he's been about it. Um, I, um, I have not suffered, you know, I have not, I, I don't have anything particularly interesting to say about my own, um, whether I was on any sort of uh, psychological journey in this myself. Obviously I was drawn to it because I have family history there, but a pretty, you know, my dad left after, he left for college and never went back except to visit. Um, it didn't feel particularly connected to my own Jewish life. Um, except in one way that I'll get to maybe with a final slide in a minute in terms of my own sense of, you know, why bad things happen to good people, which is a question I think you're as qualified to ask as I am, you know. 
Um, and I will also say that temperamentally, I'm not a depressive. I think I'm, I, I have to say, I think given what I know some other journalists have been through when they've reported on mass killings, um, there's a whole range of experiences and some of them come out of it very help, hopeful or fine and some are very affected by it. I think temperamentally I'm someone who has affected a lot of the stuff I've written about pretty well and I don't tend to dwell in it very much. Um, I think that's just maybe a, a, a quirk of genetics. Um, the people who told stories, I will say, some pe people very badly want to tell, as you know in the work you do, people do want to be heard. Not everyone is an extrovert and wants to be heard loudly. Some people only want to be heard by their therapist or their loved ones or their teacher or somebody close. But some people want their stories to be heard um, publicly. And I would say that the response rate of people I wanted to talk to who responded affirmatively to me and granted me an interview, almost always on, an on-the-record interview in which they were willing to have their names used, was well over 90%. And I think that people very much felt that, um, that their stories, whatever their small piece of this was, uh, they wanted it to be heard. And I will say, I, the notes I have gotten from people who are in the book, notes I was terrified to get. I mean, the scariest email to get is the email from somebody who's just read the book, which they've all been doing in the last couple weeks because the book just came out. And you see it in, 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 in your inbox an email from so-and-so and you think, <clears throat> and to a person they've said, you did a, you know, thank you for telling our story. So I can only speak that for them it seems to have been um, worthwhile. Yeah. Can I just add one so, quick thing? There's a wonderful book by Shoshana Feldman and Dory Laub, who did all of the uh, Shoah Foundation interviews with survivors, which is called Trauma. I highly recommend it. It might be a helpful book in terms of long-form storytelling and healing. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm, I've been asked, how is the community doing today? You know, because my last flight out was, was as COVID was descending. And that was by, it wasn't because of COVID. I actually had planned a last trip. I was buying my tickets way in advance to get the cheapest possible rates, right? So I was buying, like, if I could find a $90 ticket out of Logan Airport in Boston, I'd buy five of them over five consecutive weeks. So my last ticket was actually, like, March 18th, 2020 or something like that. And I flew in. And the flight was maybe three quarters full or half full. And when I flew back out three days later, there were four of us on the flight. Like, it had, dis it had descended. And that was, in fact, the trip I had planned as my last research trip. So that was when I was last there. Um, you know, I, I take the book up through about 12 or 13 months after the shooting. I, I think that it's so hard to disentangle COVID from everything else. So much of this book is about how much interpersonal relationships matter. It's so much about the hug that they get in the Giant Eagle supermarket or it, you know, Murray Avenue Kosher or um, Amazing Books and Records or the public library right there on Forbes. It, it's, it's so much about how we are primed as human beings to want actual proximity and to see people in person and get unexpected hugs and not live our lives on the internet. And that's, and, and, and that's so much of what makes this community remarkable is that because of proximity and good geography and intentionality, but also some accidents of history, they are a physically and spiritually close-knit community. And so COVID has obviously taken a big uh, swipe at that. But my sense is that, you know, look, everyone's on their own personal uh, road. There are definitely people, you know, there's a woman who still tells me my son is still afraid to wear his yarmulke in public, you know, or wear the Star of David around his neck. Or, I mean, you, there are still people who are not well, of course. But I think that by and large, you know, the, the story of this book is that Squirrel Hill is much bigger than the, than the shooter. Are there other questions? If not, we're going to turn to folks at Zoom. I'm hoping Jesse, you're going to hear her up in the booth for a moment. But Jesse, do we have some questions from our Zoom audience? We have, and we have one here. We'll come, we'll oh, come we, back. We'll come right back let's, to you. Let's go, go Zoom it, yeah. Go ahead. We'll take the question in the audience first. Oh, okay. Right, so the gentleman recounts a story about um, a Muslim 
cab driver who said this was not surprising that Pittsburgh reacted this way. Yeah, look, P Pittsburgh is not, not only are there historically good relations amongst different ethnicities in Pittsburgh, um, rel you know, with tensions, of course, and some of the strongest tensions have been between whites, broadly speaking, and black people, um, of whom there's a very small number in Pittsburgh, which is interesting. Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, all have much higher percentages of African Americans. So in some ways, oftentimes African Americans in Pittsburgh uh, loom smaller in the story than they would elsewhere and often themselves feel like a bit of an afterthought. Um, that said, there is a history relative to other cities of better inter-ethnic relations in Pittsburgh. It is something people work at. It's something that, that, that they have striven for and I think largely achieved. The other thing to keep in mind is, um, especially, and I say this as a, you know, a, a fast-talking, somewhat abrupt uh, and coarsened New Englander, is that although they will deny it, Pittsburghers are Midwesterners. You know, they are very, you know, they, they are practically in Ohio. <laughs> and there is a basic culture of niceness there. I mean, they stopped for yellow lights. And, um, you know, that goes far. I mean, fundamental niceness is, really does transcend often political differences and other differences and, and create a culture of helpfulness and decency. Decency matters a lot, you know, and we, we tend to forget that because we're so polarized along political lines, but, you know, like, decent, fundamental human decency is, um, is enormously healing. You know, sometimes what you need is someone to just smile, however sincerely. And, or hug you. And there's a lot of that spirit in Pittsburgh, much more so than there is in, say, New York City, which is a wonderful place with wonderful people, but it's not as much in the culture there. Okay, Jesse, you're up. We're gonna ask the questions up on Zoom. Jesse, go ahead. All right, Re Rebecca from Zoom, Zoom asks, was this event a catalyst to show to non-Jews that anti-Semitism is still with us? I feel that when I speak of anti-Semitism to non-Jews, especially here in Seattle, I receive a quizzical look as if anti-Semitism isn't really that prevalent. Yeah, as I said earlier, um, it's so tricky, right? Because for many Jews, anti-Semitism is invisible. For most Gentiles, anti-Semitism is invisible. Um, but I think, and look, I'm, I'm an optimist. And <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a like hopeless optimist by nature. I'm a cheery person. I'm almost Pollyannish. I don't walk around thinking about anti-Semitism except when I write a book about it. <laughs> so it's not, you know, it, it's, um, I'm somebody who tends to very much feel that we are, uh, Jews in America are among the privileged of history. That said, you know, we've never had a major national politician who has worn a yarmulke. I mean, Joe Lieberman, Orthodox Jew, try finding a picture of him on Google Images with a yarmulke on. You'll find more pictures of Barack Obama in a yarmulke than <laughs> Joe Lieberman. You can't win an office in this country as a visibly presenting Jew, you know? But, you know, wear a big cross as a Christian, that gets you votes in a lot of places. I mean, I, I mean, the reality is America loves its Jews, but it loves its cultural Jews. It loves its Jews who have given America, you know, good comedy and bagels. And um, there's no reason to believe that there's a lot, that there's a deep fund of, of affection for the Jewish acts of going to synagogue or keeping kosher or putting up air roofs or not working on the Sabbath or things like that. I mean, I don't think America's really been tested in terms of what it would be like to be dealing with, with Jews who are, who are doing it. And so I think it's a very tricky question. We'll have an author coming up who just wrote a book from the Palo Alto JCC called Why Be Jewish? So hopefully that's a good plug for for that. Um, Jesse, do we have some more questions on Zoom? Okay. Okay. So are there any other final questions? Yeah, Gary, go ahead. You know, oh, that's so interesting. The question was, can I compare the response to other mass shootings? Um, the FBI defines a mass killing as any single event in which four or more people are killed. And by that definition, there have been several hundred of them since Columbine in 1999. Um, we have not begun to understand what we've gone through in the past 22 years. No country has ever gone through anything quite like it. Other countries have gone through other terrible things, but the idea that killing random people with a gun would become an epidemic <laughs> is really strange and we have no real way of understanding it. And of course, it's terrifying in a way that more predictable killings are not, the, the random nature of it. 
to answer your question, there's so many ways to answer your question, but let me say this. If you think about mass killings in American history, very few of them have a, a, have a, have a target that in any way makes coherent sense. You know, mass killings are always nonsensical and in a sense insane. But, they're, but most of them are even doubly and trebly insane because somebody decides to shoot up a shopping mall or a post office or a high school that they may not even have attended. It's just a place where they can find a lot of people. It's actually very few mass killings that have targeted, say, a house of worship um, or some other place where you can say, oh, there's an ideology under attack, not just bodies made of flesh, but some idea. So Squirrel Hill actually, Tree of Life actually has very few analogs in that regard. Mother Emmanuel in Charleston, there was a Sikh temple attacked outside Milwaukee. Um, you know, it, it's actually, like very few houses of worship have been hit. And I think that um, one reason this got so much attention is because it was a house of worship and that strikes at something very deep in a country founded among other things on freedom of religion. Um, and so the people in Squirrel Hill, I think, certainly think of themselves as closest, that their closest kin and what they've gone through are the people in the community that lost nine black Christians in 2015 um, at the, uh, the Mother Emanuel shooting, Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. But actually, most people in America who've been killed um, in these killings have been killed alongside people they didn't know but just happened to be shopping with that day or seeing a movie with, which has a kind of special sadness all of its own. And in some ways, the book that I, that I wrote is about, well, what happens when the people know each other and the community knows them and can come together around them? That's, that's a pretty rare thing um, in American Jewish history. Um, can, I, can I close by, can we go back to that slide? Yeah, but I, de I definitely wanted to ask about the dog because uh, as an animal lover, you did want to talk about the dogs that people bring in. And I just wanted to know if you wanted to add anything with respect to the, that, that the people that descended, the people that wanted right. to do something, all these dogs descending on Pittsburgh and right. what that meant for you. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, for me, it was always a bonus that when I left home where I have two dogs, that I found dogs to pet in Pittsburgh. Um, there, is, there was someone who said to me, someone who was very close to the killing, who, who was not herself in the building, but was very close to people who were, who said to, who said to me outside one event, the dogs showed up at a, at a lot of things. The therapy dog handlers brought them to various events where they thought people might be triggered or might be suffering trauma. And, and by the way, I'm, I understand, again, dogs definitely help me. But there was someone who, again, was one of the people suffering trauma who, who just emerged from one large public event, and walked by the dogs, and kind of grabbed me and said, enough with the fucking dogs already. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people react differently. Some people want to hug a dog, but keep in mind, some people are afraid of dogs, right? Like some people actually, the last thing they want when they're feeling raw is, is a, an 80 pound beast <laughs> trying to slobber all over them. So, I mean, everyone is different. And one of the things I wanted to get across in this book is that there are so many, the, the protagonist is the neighborhood because the neighborhood embraces dozens and dozens of individual stories, many of which have like humor and life and charm of their own but people are very different. And one of the things that happens is that certain community leaders try to get everyone on the same page. They want a sort of unified messaging in Pittsburgh as well. And that's, that does a kind of violence to the human spirit because the spirit is that we're all eccentric and we all need to process things together, but also on our own. So in, in that, actually I wanna read two more, can I read two more pages before, before I take my leave of you to go sign your books? Um, so this is just funny. I kind of want to end on a funny note, because again, the book really is a lot of fun. So remember the, remember the dude with the yarmulke, um, or, who, or who, was, who started wearing a yarmulke afterwards? Why don't we put him back up, go like two slides back. Yeah, there's, there's Zach, Zacharias, who's like such a sweetie. He is what he looks like, which is just a, a, a sweetie. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to pick up about two pages from the end of the, the Zach chapter. <clears throat> He had been wearing his yarmulke ever since. It's a new experience for me to be wearing a yarmulke out in the world on a regular basis, Zach said. It has these interesting implications. He mentioned a night when he and his girlfriend had been trying to decide where to go out and eat. I was like, well, Gooskies is open. And then I was like, but I've heard they had some Nazis at Gooskies. Zach was referring to the rumor that at some point, 
some sort of neo-Nazi punk band had played a gig at Guski's, a small dive bar in the Polish Hill neighborhood. Zach figured the rumor was probably false, but his head was spinning with possibility. He thought about the overlap between punks, many of whom lived in Polish Hill, and various strains of white nationalist ideology. And then he realized that if there were neo-Nazis hanging out at Guski's, he now looked like a target. But I didn't want to take my yarmulke off, he said, to go to Guski's to have dinner. That didn't feel right. That's some kind of bizarre paying of obeisance to the ghost or not ghost Nazis. And I don't want to do that. But I also don't want to not go to Guski's if I want to go to some neighborhood bar that has good vegan kielbasa. The yarmulke complicated everything. If he took off the yarmulke, the neo-Nazis, real or imagined, would win. But if he kept the yarmulke on but skipped Guski's, the neo-Nazis, real or imagined, would still win by depriving him of tasty vegan kielbasa. But if he said yes to the yarmulke and to Guski's, he put his visibly Jewish self in sight of the real or imaginary neo-Nazis. To be clear, there is no evidence that neo-Nazis hang out at Guski's. Zach weighed his options, screwed up his courage, and took himself and his girlfriend to Guski's. When he stepped inside, he took a look around, and his first thought was, these are not people who want to hurt me. They're not anti-Semitic people here. He saw a coworker at the bar reading the New York Times app on his iPhone as he drank a beer and smoked a cigarette. It was all copacetic. But the yarmulke was not finished with him yet. He and his girlfriend sat at the bar and placed their orders. I made a very expensive order by mistake, he said. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't get all that. He turned away from the bar to look at his menu to figure out what to order instead. And as he turned away, he noticed the bartender looking at his yarmulke. And then he was immediately concerned that she would see him changing his order as a manifestation of his Jewishness. I was like, oh, God damn it. Now I'm some sort of money-grubbing Jew. <laughs> like, I'm complaining about the expensive order and adjusting my order to be less expensive. So I felt bad about that because now I'm a symbol of all the Jews. I'm the standard bearer for all these people for whom I don't bear a standard. Zach was still feeling like the guy in a yarmulke who had flagged a problem with his restaurant tab when something compounded his misery. He lifted his bottle of yingling. It's, it's Pittsburgh, so it's probably yingling. I actually asked him what beer was. He's like, I don't know, call it yingling. He lifted his bottle of yingling to his mouth to have a sip, and a bit of it sloshed out and landed on a man sitting next to him at the bar. It was just a tiny bit of beer, and it seemed that the man didn't notice. So Zach elected not to say anything. I thought, ah, oh, he doesn't notice, doesn't matter. But no sooner had Zach elected not to say anything than the man turned around. He had noticed. Zach quickly apologized, hoping to make everything right. But it was too late. I was like, I'm sorry, I spilled some beer. But I hadn't said it when I spilled it. So yet again, I think like, now I'm a jerk, a selfish, unapologetic Jew person. So it's even worse, everything is bad. He threw up his hands in despair. A public Jew never. So that's, that's, that was Zach's experience. Like all of this flowing from the attack at Tree of Life. I want to go one slide forward, and then we'll, we'll take it out with this. Yeah. So um, I'll get out of my own way so I can read this. this is, so I didn't, I didn't dedicate the book to anyone. You know, books now often have dedications. And I kind of felt like, you know, I mean, I love my wife dearly, but like to Sid, who made it all possible, would be an odd dedication in a book about 11 people getting. It just didn't feel right. Um, and I didn't know the 11 who died, and I didn't, you know. Anyway, um, I, this is the epigraph to the book. This is what I put in the front. I am the Lord, and you shall keep my Sabbaths, and you shall venerate my sanctuary. For if you follow my laws and keep my commandments, I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and no one shall terrify you. And this is from Leviticus. We read it um, every Saturday. We read a version of it in the conservative prayer book, in the, in the prayer for peace. Um, I will rid the land of vicious beasts, and you shall lie down, and no one shall terrify you. And if you go and look at sort of where that's from, I think they're taking it largely from Leviticus. And this stunned me, right? The promise that God makes to the Jewish people is if you keep the Sabbath, then no one shall terrify you. And this haunted me the whole time I was in Pittsburgh. I mean, once I figured that, I thought, oh, my God, wait a second. God actually promised them that if they keep the Sabbath, if they do what Jews are supposed to do on the Sabbath, and walk to synagogue and pray together, no one will terrify me. And they went to synagogue on the Sabbath. And look what happened. And, um, you know, I'm not that kind of religious person. One friend of mine said, well, did you really think that in the Bible, that God, like lots of people have kept the Sabbath and been murdered in cold blood? Yes, I know. I know. But um, 
I do always want to bear in mind that that these people died because they, on that morning, were were doing it. And um, you know, in that sense, they really are martyrs. But also, they lived in a great neighborhood, and um, and it sent me on a journey to meet the people who had spent their time remembering them. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for those of you on Zoom. I want to thank all of our volunteers and people in the booth for helping out. Just a quick bit of logistics. If you bought a book, we're going to actually ask Mark to quickly go back into the cafe, and that way we can sign books if you have a copy of your book. Come meet us. We're also selling additional copies. I just want to say a big round of applause. The book, as you read from the last section, is poignant and emotionally gripping and very funny in a lot of places, and clearly the interviews that Mark did tell an incredible story. I can't believe the richness of the interviews. So if you haven't bought a book, it, it, it just was such a quick read. I couldn't believe it. It's an amazing book. Please thank everybody for Mark Oppenheimer coming here to the JCC, getting across the country for our first live event and hopefully not our last. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you in the cafe. Thank you.